hi there and welcome back to my channel my name is Vuvu and this is Vuvu Vena Read and today is day five of VVR Reader I hope you guys are enjoying it so far and as you can see from the title we are keeping with the Friday reads what Friday reads first chapter Friday's chapter the first chapter Friday's theme and our first one of the month is this firm fave right a friend of mine was asking me about this recently and I was like cha you guys can see what I did when I first read it okay it is definitely something that's not talked about talked about as often as I want it to be and this is House of Stone by Novuyo Rosa Chuma uh, Zimbabwean author but you know how first chapter Fridays go uh, we will chat about that just now but if you are curious about it do stay tuned so Bubavena underscore reads is an amazing book reviewer also youtuber she reviews books on youtube and if i'm not mistaken she also has a blog as well so please if for your connection with literature get in touch with or follow at v-u-v-u-v-e-n-a underscore reads she is based in south africa and i think it is also extremely important to follow literary content creators who are based outside of who are based outside of the west and in continental africa because they do a really good job of Bridging the gap. We appreciate you, Vuvu, for bringing us turning pages and for bringing us your booktube channel. You know, this is a chance for people to actually see some people that I really enjoy. Please consider pressing the red subscribe button down below. And if you are returning, welcome back, fam. Vuvu, you are amazing. Thank you so much for your time. Let me get a sip of water. I just came across this water at like my local coffee shop, right? I don't know if you guys can see it is a sparkling water um, called Perlage. Perlage has a gentle fizz, natural um, mineral water. I just want to see because it, it doesn't look like it's South African, okay? It's something there. It's written in a language that I would be lying if I said I knew. Mm, I want to say, mm, let me not say, just expose myself because definitely languages are not my thing okay but absolutely love it absolutely absolutely stunning okay let's talk about the cover as per usual house of stone for me the pattern on its own does give off a bit of the zimbabwean culture the zimbabwean flag etc i don't know if you guys can see it but uh, the pattern of the words that is and we've got this um, half picture of um, a gentleman who looks quite intense, right? I don't want to give the story away because I have read it, but he looks quite intense. It looks like there's a lot on his mind or that there is a lot of scheming going on. And um, at the back here, I'm not going to show you the prize. At the back here, uh, you see some bullets. So that does tell you that there is definitely something dangerous occurring in this book. The spine looks like that. Am I showing it to you guys properly? looks like that which i absolutely absolutely adore i love this cover so much i don't want to lie to you guys um the front reads um an extraordinary achievement and this is what helon habila habila from the guardian had to say um let me tell you a bit about the author Ugh, there's no picture of her um okay i'll tell you a bit about the author from what's written at the back i wish there was a picture of her it says novuyo rosa chuma grew up in zimbabwe and has lived in south africa and the usa she is a graduate of the iowa writers workshop her short fiction has been featured in numerous in numerous anthologies and she was awarded the 2014 herman charles bosman prize for the best literary work in english um this one i think <clears throat> I don't know what's going on with my throat child it's so inappropriate this one was published in 2018 okay let's hope that worked um so the back reads a gripping account of revolution and its aftermath both for a country and for one man a v than guyan pulitzer prize winning author of the sympathizer is the person who says that so the synopsis reads because he has gone missing his father abed and his mother agnes cling to the hope that he has 
run away but only the lodger seems to have any real idea zamani has lived in the spare room for years now quiet polite well read and well healed he's almost part of the family but almost isn't quite good enough for zamani cajoling coaxing and coercing a, a bad and Agnes into revealing their sometimes tender, often brutal life stories. Zamani aims to steep himself in borrowed family history so that he can fully inherit and inhabit its uncertain future. A towering and multi layered gem, one of the greatest ever novels about Zimbabwe, is what Novalet Bulawayo, author of We Need New Names, had to say about this. And listen, I agree with her. <laughs> Definitely this book was everything. Um, so chapter one, or rather it's going to be the prologue. You know how we do, okay? If a book has a prologue, we treat that as the first chapter reading. If it didn't, then we would have read chapter one, okay? Cool. This one is subdivided into parts, but instead of calling them part one, etc., it's called book one, book two. You get my feel. Mm -hmm. Oh, and it's all of 372 pages long. Um, don't think I've missed anything. I'm rusty. Forgive me. Okay, here we go. Prologue. I am a man on a mission. A vocation, call it, to remake the past and a wish to fashion all that has been into being and becoming. It all started when my surrogate father, Abednego Mlambo, sought me out in my lodgings two days ago with a bottle of bells in one hand and two crystal glasses pressed to his chest. He was dressed in a pair of his faded beige don't-touch-my-ankles trousers that give him the look of a civil servant complete with a matching shirt. He held the crystal glasses in place with his chin, one balanced atop the other. The bottom glass clasped between the thumb and the forefinger of the hand clutching the bells, the top glass muzzling his mouth so that his voice reached me as though a daydream, as he said, raising his free hand and slapping my back, that he appreciated how I'd taken his son, Bukosi, under my wing, playing big brother, and that I was like a son to him, and he would, from then on, call me his surrogate son. I would have, it would have been perfect, and may even have made me cry, for no man ever claimed to be for no man ever claimed me as his son. And Abednego, not... It would have been perfect. And may even have made me cry. For no man ever claimed me as his son. Had Abednego not beaten me to it, his sagging yellow face suddenly marked by sadness as he began to shed tears for that Bukosi, like he has been doing ever since the boy went missing. If only he knew how the boy once made the eerie confession that he wished it was I who was his father and not he, Abednego. Never mind that, I'm only 24 and Bukosi has just turned 17. He's been missing for over a week, since the beginning of October. Yes, I must say it again to believe it. It's already beginning to feel to me as though the boy never existed at all. Bukosi is missing. Bukosi is missing. Bukosi is missing. Abednego sat down heavily on my little put up, put me up bed, sitting clutched, sitting clutching the whiskey and the glasses, and snortily apologized for crying. I watched his tears drip, dripping into the crystal glass, like our taps on the days when the municipal doesn't cut off the water supply, and tried to cluck. Some, and tried to cluck sympathetically. He confessed that it pained him to say the boy's name out loud, to look up as though at any moment he would hear his heavy steps thudding on Mama Agnes's polished cement floor and see his plump walnut face peeping around the living room door. I wanted to reach out and hold him, but he had never shared, but we had never shared such moments, him and I. I had seen him lean into Mama Agnes's embrace, inhaling the scent of her perfume, perfumed bosom as she hugged him in 
greeting when he arrived home from those long hours at the Batman rubber factory. I had also caught him and Bukosi once locked in an uncomfortable grip Sometime, something almost like a hug but not quite for their faces were held apart even as they squeezed each other's shoulders. We'll find him, I said, relieving him of the glasses but not the whiskey which he clutched possessively. I'm here for you. Bukosi, he muttered again, wincing as he said it, speaking it out loud in the same way God bespake Adam into existence. Croaking Bukosi, and therefore he was, except he wasn't. And me, I winced because I suspected he may never be found, for I was there with him when he disappeared. We were chanting side by side at the rally held by them, Twagazi, se secessionist movement, only nine days ago, on Sunday, 7 October, in Stanley Square. The the flame lilies were raging, the sunflowers sashaying and our secessionist leader, Dumo, spraying us with his saliva as he frothed up a call to arms, to secession, to revolution, to freedom. Secede from the country, Zimbabwe, he cried. Secede, secede, echoed our favorite choruses. For our brothers killed in the 80s in the Gukurahundi genocide, he cried. Secede, secede, we echoed. Secede from tyranny, secede. What, while we were thrusting peaceful fists of re revolt in the air, the riot police thrust themselves on our gathering, gathering those of us who could not run fast enough into the backs of their police vans. And that was the last time I saw Bokosi, and that's when he went missing. What would Dumo say to me now? Speak truth to death or live a dead lie? I never understood half of what Dumo said, but he had an uncanny knack of somehow hitting your heart regardless. Dumo, who tried to be my mentor, more importantly nursed my grief after my uncle Fanny's death, a grief that turned me delirious for a time. Dumo, who even so never tried, never tired of lambasting me, telling me I was useless as a revolutionary prodigy, lacking the kind of recklessness necessary to resurrect insurrection. But what does it matter what he would say to me now? I'm the one who survived and he's the one who's disappeared, thanks to those madmen mad, mad antics of his. Poof, like a sparkle, he too was gobbled up by one of those police vans the day of the Mtwagazi rally and has not been regurgitated since. Like Bukosi, I doubt I'll ever see Dumo again. It was he who taught me that a man would remake himself by remaking his past. So when Abednego said I was like a son to him and that he would from then on call me his surrogate son, I felt a swell of pride and the prick of opportunity. Perhaps as my surrogate father's son, I can be blessed with some familial affection and, in this way, finally powder away the horrors of my own murky history, bequeathed to me by parents I never knew. I have begun calling him, jokingly, but in all seriousness, surrogate father, and let the surrogacy business fool no one. I intend to be as close to the Mlambos as any real son could be, bound happily by the Bantu philosophy of Ubuntu, that communal pedigree. And even though I'm just a lodger in the Pijmi room that has squeezed into their backyard so as to rent out in these trying times, only the narrow corridor of a dirt path separates me from their back door. Even though I'm just their lodger, we already have a shared history, the Mlambos and I. For though they, know, they don't know it, I grew up in this house. It belonged to my dearly departed Uncle Fanny. Perhaps despite his insist, incessant worrying about book, over Bukosi, Abednego really is beginning to think of me too as his son. Why else did he then wipe his eyes, set his shoulders and proceed to pour us 
both generous portions of bells in the crystal glasses. And why, in spite of the fact that I knew that he's a recovering alcoholic who's been sober for five years straight since 2002 and even has a five-year AA bronze medallion to prove it, did I indulge him and drink the bells. Perhaps it was because of my eagerness to consolidate this new claim to sonhood. He quaffed he quaffed his bells much faster than I mine, topping himself up often and liberally until he was drunk, blind, and chatty proper, and then began chittering at length about his past. I did then what I understood he was asking me to do. I began to chronicle the family history he was entrusting me with, like any good son would. Our conversations, which started two days ago, are more in the way of one-sided confessions and always in the pleasant company of whiskey, which I have started supplying since. Without it, my surrogate father is rendered to grumpy, rendered a grumpy mute and take place in between our community searches for Wukosi. We sit more often than not in Mama Agnes's living room, just he and I. He slumped in his sofa, I administering the bells. It takes him a while to get to the meat of the matter. He doesn't have a tendency to go on. He does have a tendency to go on and on about the boy. Mama Agnes, thankfully, is always away during the day and sadly late into the night these days, either at work on the other side of town in the leafy suburbs of Graham's Girls High, High, Graham's Girls High, where she teaches English, or at her church, Blessed Anointings, where she goes every day to beg, bully, and bootleg the Holy Ghost into revealing the whereabouts of Bukosi. So far, to no avail. My surrogate father has given himself indefinite leave from his work at the Batman Rubber Factory until his son is found, he says. These intimacies that my surrogate father has begun sharing with me are what Bukosi always wanted from him. The boy badgered our father about the family history. Baba, he would say, he would ask at first timidly, for he anticipated the rage such questions caused Abednego, who was never stingy with the belt. Baba, although not even the sus prospect of the belt deterred him, I want to know, Baba. So strong was his desire, so brilliantly did it flicker in his emerald eyes. How did you grow up? Shimmering like a thing, hungry and searing and lost. Where were you during what was growing even more defined after I introduced him to Dumo, who took him under his wing like he had tried to do for me, feeding the boy's hunger to know the past? I need to know. You have to tell me his 17-year-old voice booming with a dangerous bass, suddenly mature in its insolence, different from his usual Britishness. I demand to know what happened during Gukurahundi. What anguish this caused our father. I noticed how his hands trembled, how it wasn't anger that made his mouth froth and sputter, but something more substantial, making the sweat break out across his forehead. And though he beat the boy, it wasn't really the boy he wanted to beat, but it seemed to me himself. The boy didn't know when and how to push, didn't know how to cultivate the kind of rapport a son needs to have with his father. But I've been watch watching, I've been paying attention, and I know how to be around a man when he's down. There's a certain silence that's soothing, and the way to do it, I've discovered, is to act as though what has just happened. The flimsy beating and ineffectual yelling and the tremors is nothing. To change neither tone nor body language, and I did this well. If I was reading the paper when a beating happened, I would continue to read the paper. I only sort of interfered when Mama Agnes was home, for she would rush to the scene yelling for Abednego to stop it as she tried to leap between him and the boy. Here I would jump up and dither dith between them as though I were doing something useful. And afterwards I would make Mama Agnes a cup of Tangada tea, 
steeped for five minutes to boiling water in boiling water with a dash of lemon just the way she likes it the only thing i ever ventured to do or to say to abednego just once after one of his altercations with the boy was were i your son i would never speak to you like that i made sure not to look at him as i said this to keep my eyes glued to the tv which i had been watching when the whole thing happened so that it was as if what i was saying was really nothing and right afterwards i turned up the volume and laughed along to whatever show was on though i don't remember much about it now i wasn't paying attention i could feel a bit nigger's eyes on me and my heart was loud in my chest i feared i had pushed too hard that i shouldn't have said anything and that by speaking about it i had angered him where i meant to soothe but he didn't rebuke me he didn't say a thing instead that evening after the electricity had abruptly cut out as it usually does nowadays he invited me to sit with him around the fire in the back where mama agnes was making supper and play a game of droughts to hear him call me son even if surrogate son when he sought me out two days ago in my lodgings was the sweet fruit of a long labor but never would i have thought my surrogate father would not only call me son but bring me into the intimacies a father shares with his son the family history perhaps had my surrogate brother because he understood our father and known him to talk to him known how to talk to him he too would have been brought into the intimacies of our family history and gain the solid footing he so desperately needed but because of the lack of which he became lost but because of the lack of which he became lost and because of the possession of which i am now found lost and found lost and found that's the end of the prologue do let me know in the description um description in the comment section down below what you thought of that i absolutely absolutely love the writing style in this book i absolutely love the way the story um is narrated and how it unfolds if you have read it just let me know what you thought about it otherwise that brings us to the end of this first chapter friday reading of novo Yo rosa chuma's house of stone and until next time i do love you guys very much for choosing me bye now